Do you? Uh... Hi, everybody. We're just waiting for folks to come in from the waiting room. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, please make sure for the moment that you are on mute. Uh, it just helps us minimize background noise so that you can hear our panelists. Um, I see more people coming in. Full house, wow, okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, formally, my name is Danielle Hartunian. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study. And welcome to Conversations with Gallatin Faculty. Uh, this session features Professor Kimberly DaCosta in conversation um, with Gallatin alumni, Mark Dones, Kate Homelish, and Arjun Parikh. Um, before we get started officially, we want to just share some Zoom recommendations for you that we've been learning for the last seven months of living life, so much of it online. Um, since you will be hearing from our speakers today, we recommend being in speaker view. Uh, this just helps spotlight for you who's actually speaking. Um, if you prefer gallery view or the Brady Bunch view, as I call it, that works as well. It's up to you. Um, speaker is just what we recommend. Um, we really look forward to engaging in conversation with all of you who are here today. So we encourage you to ask questions. Um, if you're really dying to ask something, you can use the chat function, um, which if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little chat button and some, if you click it, something will pop up on the side. You're welcome to type in questions there and we will get to them um, at the end. We do have some time reserved for Q&A. Um, and also at that time, if you would prefer to turn your video and your mic on and actually have a conversation, we encourage you to do that. All you would have to do is also at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a button that says participants. And if you click it, um, a list will pop up on the side and you'll see your own name with a little blue hand. And that's how you could use the raise hand function. Um, or you can try <laughs> just manually waving your hand and we'll try to see you. But those are all the options that we have um, and we're really excited to be working with you today. Um, so with that, I just want to introduce our really amazing panel, um, starting off with Professor Kim DaCosta. Kim, thank you so much for being here. Um, 
Where's Kim on my screen? Right here. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's screen is so different. Um, so Professor DaCosta is a sociologist interested in racial inequality and the contemporary production of racial boundaries. Her book, Making Multiracials, State, Family, and the Market in Redrawing of the Color Line, explores the cultural and social underpinnings of the, mo of the movement to create multiracial collective identity in the United States. She is currently writing on how interracial extended kin relationships speak to questions of interracial empathy, care, and politics. She teaches courses on race in different societies, social mobility, consumerism, and the commercialization of intimate life. Professor DaCosta served as an associate dean of students at the Gallatin School for seven years, so maybe a lot of you know her from that. Um, and has been involved in NYU's prison education program since its inception, most recently as its faculty director. And I'll try to remember to share a link about that because if folks out there haven't checked it out, it's amazing. Next up is Mark Dones. Mark, where are you? Hi, Mark. Welcome. Mark is a social entrepreneur, policy strategist, and social justice activist with over 10 years of experience in equitable systems transformation across local, state, and federal governmental systems. They received their BA from Gallatin in 2011. As the executive director of the National Innovation Service, which we call NIS for short, Mark oversees day-to-day -day operations and strategy for policy, design, operations, and business development work streams. NIS partners with government agencies for for-profit organizations and nonprofits to propel equity work across the policy space. They focus on homelessness and housing, racial equity, LGBTQ plus rights, violence prevention and justice systems reform, and community-based responses to substance use disorders. Prior to launching NIS, Mark held various roles in social impact, specializing in policy, program design, and continuous improvement. This includes leadership roles at the Future Company and Center for Social Innovation, which we refer to as C4. At C4, Mark led the SPARC initiative, which stands for Supporting Partnerships for Anti-Racist Communities, which engaged eight, over eight jurisdictions, over 20 agencies in the US government in efforts to transform the national conversation about housing. Outside the direct systems of transformation, Mark is a faculty member at the School of Visual Arts and leverages their experience as a keynote speaker and panelist. They have spoken at the White House and Harvard University. Next up is Kate Homelish. Where's Kate? Hi, Kate. Kate is a strategy consultant with a focus on social impact. She has designed and executed fully integrated customer engagement events, built multi-channel communication strategies, and identified partnership and CSR opportunities for some of the world's leading Fortune 100 companies. Kate received her BA from Gallatin in 2012 and an MSc in Theory and History of International Relations from the London School of Economics in 2018. She currently serves on the board of the Vineyard Arts Project, an incubator for new works in dance and theater. And last but certainly not least, we have Arjun Parikh joining us. Hi, Arjun. Arjun is a first year law student at the University of Michigan Law School. His undergraduate internships include legal services for prisoners with children, California State Senator Scott Weiner and Hillary for America. He spent 2019 in South Bend, Indiana as a policy assistant on Pete Buttigieg's presidential campaign. He plans on focusing on antitrust and competition and juvenile justice during law school. Welcome to all of our speakers. I'm now going to turn it over to Kim. Thank you so much, Danielle. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, when I was asked to participate in this, it was easy to say yes, because um, it gives me a chance to connect with my 
students that I love so much. And it almost brings a tear to my eye to just listen to all the great things that you've collectively been up to. Um, this is what I and so many of my colleagues, why we do the work that we do. Um, so this session is about a, the themes in a class that I'm teaching right now. It's one of the first year seminars um, at Gallatin. And I'll give you just a brief overview of the kinds of questions and themes that we talk about so before we launch into our uh, discussion. So you know, faith in the notion that one can attain success and virtue through hard work is a dominant ideology in American life. We exalt those who pull themselves up by their bootstraps. We repeatedly tell of that ancestor who came with a dollar in her pocket and achieved wealth and we extol the virtues of the underdog who through grit and determination succeeds despite the odds. This American dream promises self-fulfillment, material comfort, and importantly, social mobility, surpassing one's parents in status and socioeconomic standing. It also imagines the US as a meritocracy in which you, where, who you are and where you're from does not preclude success for anyone willing to work for it. And yet, realizing the American dream has always been more difficult for some groups than others. And a deep skepticism of its possibility has always been part of US social and political discourse. As inequality has soared in recent years, and by some accounts, you're more likely to achieve the American dream in Canada, that skepticism has moved to the center of political and social debates. You might recall five years ago when candidate Trump said the American dream is dead. And Bernie Sanders called wealth and income inequality the great moral issue of our time. So convening as we are in the wake of ongoing and unpunished police killings of black people and a global pandemic, the harshest impacts of which devastate the most marginalized communities among us. And 10 days out from a presidential election that is as much a, refer a stress test of our democracy as it is a referendum on Americans' tolerance for obscene levels of inequality, it seems that an assessment and discussion or perhaps a lament for the American dream is entirely appropriate right now. So, when I teach this course on the American dream, we think about it as a cultural concept and as a social reality and ask questions like, to what extent concerns about the self, can I achieve social mobility and material wealth and status and social mobility still animate the way we think about the good life in the United States. Um, and so when thinking about uh, Mark, Kate, and Arjun, and how, what we would begin our discussion with, I asked them to think about the American dream in their own lives, and also reflect on it in light of the work that they've been doing out in the world um, since leaving Gallatin. And I suppose I would ask all of you to kind of think about that for yourselves as we begin this discussion, and hopefully, um, that will come into the Q&A. So with that, I am going to ask Arjun to start. <laughs> um, what specifically do you want me to start with? All right, just right, let's just start with the broad questions about how you think about this notion of the American dream and its status either in your own life or in the kinds of work that you've been doing. You've been yeah. so connected to political life of late and it seems especially yeah. right um, So a little bit about me. Um, my, so my grandparents moved here in the 60s and you could say uh, they came with um, just a dollar in their pocket, but they also came with uh, PhDs because that's the only way you can really get from India to the United States. So I mean, even within my own family, um, we, we love the narrative that like we, <laughs> My grandparents, they made themselves from nothing in the United States, but like, I mean, starting with that kind of advanced education is, um, I think, just a massive head start. Um, so, I mean, I, I grew up with education just being harped on me all the way through. And I mean, quite frankly, growing up in Palo Alto and having my parents and grandparents around, it would have been pretty difficult 
short of me intentionally failing my classes not to end up at a school like NYU. Um, it doesn't mean I didn't work hard, but it, it was also almost inevitable in some ways. Um, as for the work I've done, um, I think I want to talk a little bit more about um, my time on Mayor Pete's campaign, um, where I was part of the team that was tasked with creating Pete's plan for the future. And it's like that, that meant anywhere from 30 to 50 policies. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to get a quick show of hands on how many people know how presidential campaigns make uh, policy. Right. Um, I do one. now because Arjun told me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like, these teams are really small. There's only eight of us on Pete's campaign by the end of it. Um, I know Obama in 2008 had about 15 to 20. Um, the real work is all those people like on, on the ground, on the campaign, getting paired with um, these committees of experts. Um, and these committees have between, I mean, so Pete's campaign had 800 by the end of it. Um, Obama had, I think, 1,800 by the end of 2008. And these are um, just sets of experts in various fields. Um, so in, in terms of like who is actually making the policy, it's not the policy writers on the campaign. It's whatever experts the policy chair and policy director on a campaign actually have access to. So then like, let's, let's say in theory, you get some, you get a, older white man that only has older white male friends and that's his network, um, you might end up with an entire committee on a certain topic with just that kind of representation. So representation on like, any given issue is extremely random. <laughs> um, and I think we, we like to have this view of policy being made in a really methodical and um, intentional way, but it doesn't really happen like that. It's just kind of all over the place and a lot depends on who the net, who, like, who's in the network. Um, I think that's a good starting point for policymaking campaigns. Okay, let's keep that in mind as we um, move along because it speaks, I think, to some of the issues as to, um, that I hope we'll get into at some point as to um, um, what we might expect as workable, responsive policies to the kinds of inequalities that um, all I, I, some of which I've described, what I think will come out as more of us um, speak. All right, let's hold that thought for a sec. Mark, jump in here. Tell me something about your relationship to one, your experience of the American dream, perhaps your critique of American dream thinking and how you've seen that play out in the work that you do. Sure, uh, I, I think, um, I'm, I'm having like a deep flashback to being in school with you <laughs> and often the, 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 what, what was always the presupposition is that I had a critique. <laughs> and so I do, I have several critiques. Um, so one, I think that like, to be clear, um, my interaction personally with the American dream is as something that is always outside of me, right? It is not something that I am inside of. It is something that is adjacent to me that happens to other people that other people are caught up in the sweep of. Um, and I experience it, right? And I believe a lot of us experience it as a form of violence because it is a narrative that is uh, told to us again and again and again, but it is so out, again, outside of our experience um, that it begins to feel hallucinatory, right? You, you are told repeatedly that there is a thing happening uh, and all evidence in your life points directly to the contrary. Um, my, uh, I grew up in a uh, wealthy suburb in Michigan uh, outside of Detroit. And for a long time, I sort of let that surface narrative be the narrative, right? That like I came from a family that had access to things and I went to private schools and I wound up going to NYU and et cetera, et cetera. It's only recently in my career actually that I've started to like peel that onion and be like, actually the bank tried to foreclose on us almost yearly. <laughs> like oh. actually there were repo men who we hid behind the couch in the living room from, right? Like there was a period where we didn't have a vehicle because both of them had been repossessed. Like those are things that happen, right? And so, and, I, and I'm finally at a place, right? Where I think, you know, at, at my big age of like running and owning a company and doing work around the country that I feel situated enough to express those things without fear that they will undercut my validity in the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
and in part, right, what we should what we should understand is that um, the validity that we ask people to show up with, and my fear that talking about that would undercut that validity is the double-edgedness or the lie embedded in the American dream, right? That we say to people, we want you to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, but we deeply hate poor people and we hate black people and we hate people with disabilities. We as a nation hate these people. And so to show up and profess to having been poor is a sin, right? It's to say like, I have this shameful, dirty experience that I now can let you in on, right? That, that feeling is shared by so many people. And so I think that one of the things, you know, that I am sort of thinking about, and you said, you know, perhaps we want to lament this idea. I want to lament that we ever had the idea. It was a bad idea to have. Um, and, you know, the thing that's in my head right now and, and, and perhaps can be part of the conversation, right, is this Martin Luther King quote where he says, you know, how cruel it is to say to a bootless man, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. It makes no sense. And in this country, what we have done repeatedly is use this myth-making uh, facility to tell ourselves a lie about what we do when all we have actually done is concentrate wealth, concentrate power in a very narrow uh, rung of largely white men while we tell everybody that they live in the fairest, greatest country in the world. And uh, yeah, if, if we're talking about dreams, that is in fact a dream. Okay, um, Mark, it's just like 10 years ago. <laughs> I love it. Okay, but Mark, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna let each one speak and then we can sort of go back and forth. There's so, so much to build on here. All right, Kate, what do you have to say about this? Well, thanks for letting me go last, that was sweet. <laughs> um, I've, I mean, so much to say on it. I think my personal relationship to the American dream, um, like Arjun starts with my grandparents. Um, both my grandfathers fought in World War II. They came back from World War II. They both had the opportunity to use the GI Bill. They were both um, in a position to, in fact, be the first generation to go to college, the first generation of my family to own a home, um, which allowed my parents to build on top of that. Now as a millennial, I look at my parents' success and I question if I will actually, if we're talking about the American dream as doing more and succeeding more, having more wealth, having more power, whatever than your parents. I mean, I've also chosen a career that would make that difficult as far as financially, but I'm not sure if I had picked another career that I still would have been able to um, meet those um, benchmarks. Additionally, I, I can't help but sort of think about the audience here. So you're all either students at Gallatin, alumni of Gallatin, or parents of students at Gallatin. Um, and I think it, you know, we can't ignore the fact that it's a privilege to be able to send your kid or attend a school like Gallatin. That, you know, we don't leave this program with, um, you know, your, your average degree. Um, we certainly learn all sorts of other things. We have incredible critical thinking skills, but to be able to say to an 18 year old, um, yeah, that's the school that A, we're willing to pay for, or B, you should be planning to spend the rest of your life paying off is a really um, important thing to be thinking about, I think, in, in terms of what the American dream is. Um, as far as how I see the American dream playing out around me, I am working for a nonprofit in New York City that works with New York City public school kids um, offering uh, arts education. Um, is sort of our, our, our foundational mission, but really it's about offering kids an opportunity. Um, we, off, we have a lot of um, tutoring and SAT support and all the sorts of things that I, as someone who grew up in the northern suburbs, had access to based on my socioeconomic status. And we're offering that um, to kids in New York and watching this process of online learning has been so painful. The number of points where access issues are coming up is I think more than anyone could have fathomed, but I mean, starting as simple as like, people don't necessarily have broadband. They don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have, if you have a family of four kids, you maybe have one computer or one tablet, or maybe everyone's using their cell phone. Um, and, 
you know, you, you, it's, it's been a very eye-opening um, experience, things that I was already obviously aware of, but seeing it play out in this particular situation has been um, really troubling to watch. Yeah, okay. All really important questions. And, and I think, you know, as I listened to the three of you, I wanted to draw out a few themes and see if we can build on them because, you know, Arjun started us off in some ways offering a, a, a subtle critique of um, the use of the American dream narrative to explain his family's trajectory, but noting that um, it's not a rags to riches story. It's a certain kind of, you know, only being able to sort of access the society once you've already built those crucial skills that keep one on the top of the economic and, and, and job tiers in this country. Um, but Arjun, you emphasized what we like to tell ourselves in some ways, a bootstrap story. Um, Kate, you're describing the, the social policies that enabled your grandparents to actually experience social mobility. It's not that nobody rises up the economic ladder in the United States. I could tell that story about myself. Um, parents raised one in extreme poverty, one in the working class. Um, and we've most of us have experienced mobility, although some of us among my siblings have experienced downward mobility. Um, so you make a case in some ways for who certain policies like the GI Bill, et cetera, have benefited. Um, while in the midst of this pandemic right now, we see all of the manifestations of the ways that those um, benefits have not accrued equally to different communities. And Mark, of course, you're talking about the ways that there is a certain kind of cultural pressure and a social pressure to appear to be in a class, so a higher high economic class so that you will be deemed worthy of respect. And so one of the deep aspects of this ideological framework is the way that it encourages um, a certain kind of orientation to look upwards, that that is the source. If you have material wealth, you can also access status and prestige. And these two things are important um, to access the other goods that the society has to offer. Um, James Baldwin, and I will, I will always butcher quotes off the top of my head. But, you know, the reason he was so critical of the reason we didn't have certain kinds of forms of mobilization in the United States is because everyone thinks that they're the candidate for the boss's, uh, the hand of the boss's daughter. This is from letter from a region in my mind. Everyone thinks I don't need the group as long as I, because I individually can escape my origins. So deep in that, that critique you're offering, Mark, are the ways that um, it's the ideological framework itself that we need to question. And I'm, I guess, given what you've all described in your professional and personal experience, what might we, what ought we substitute for this ideological framework? Because many people would say to you, I mean, I'm, a, I'm married to an immigrant who came from a, a poor country, um, that this actually is a place of opportunity, right? That this dream motivates a lot of people. What do you say to that? How do we respond to people who believe it even if it's not necessarily serving them? I had the experience of living in another country for a few years, that country being the UK. And while there are endless reasons that there are issues with their social system, the fact that as a student, at for a very low rate, I was able to buy into their national healthcare system, while knowing I wasn't going to be having a job there, that I knew that in any situation, my medical bills would not create an issue for me. And then juxtaposing that to coming back to the US and not having a job immediately upon return and having to 
pay out of pocket for my insurance. Um, to me, my, it's sort of about the public versus private safety nets that we have created in this country and how so much of that is expected to land on employers. But then you have to have the conversation of who has the privilege of having the kind of employers who can offer you those sorts of safety nets. Okay, yeah, fundamentally tying healthcare to employment seems like a bad idea. <laughs> um, Go ahead. Can I build off what Kate just said? So I think that there's something in, in what you said, Kim, in terms of like, you know, people look at this country and they say like, oh, but there are, there's stuff here. There's a lot of stuff here. That is absolutely correct. But I think that we need to delineate between material availability versus material access, right? Um, and that, right, is, is a core economic delineation, right? Just because there is stuff around doesn't mean it's your stuff. Um, and so when we look at uh, capitalist formulations, right, that the, uh, the creation of things, the availability of uh, class items, of you know, ways to denote various classes is a core uh, uh, supposition in capitalism, right? But in what Kate's talking about, which is various socialized or more communal forms of economy, right? We see that there is a higher prioritization on uh, access rather than that there's a bunch of it, right? And what I would also add, right, is that like in those kinds of communal uh, economic structures, we're also able to have a conversation, not just about access, but about outcome, right? So for example, looking at the education system, we often have a whole, all manner of conversation about do folks of color, particularly black students have access to these institutions? Fantastic conversation, I love to have it. But let's look at the dropout rates, right? of those uh, people of color once they get to those institutions. Like, let, let's look at the completion rates. Let's look at the debt burdens that they graduate with and how that in turn, right, drives the decisions that they have to make about job choices, et cetera. So when, uh, when you read that writ large, for example, you look at a population like black women who are the most educated population in this country, full stop. There is no data set that will tell you otherwise. However, right, guess who doesn't make any money? Black women. And it's because, right, when you correlate those educational outcomes with the debt burdens, the career choices that get made after that are not about what do I want to do, what would fulfill me, what puts me on a long-term path. It's about what's going to pay this mountain of loans. And all of that, right, to me comes down to, and you said it when you talked about this orientation, right? To, like, so, so NIS, the shop that I run is a systems design shop and uh, the degree that I graduated from Gallatin with uh, is, is theoretically, it's an, it, we're all graduates of individualized learning, but, mm -hmm. but the title of my BA is Psychiatric Anthropology. Um, and so my focus, right, was very much on the interaction between uh, large scale systems, cultural formations and behavior, right? How does a system create behavior? Um, and my, my team now focuses on redesigning public infrastructure and public systems with a focus on how might we get different behaviors, different outcomes. And your question about orientation really resonates with me because I start almost every single project, right, with looking at a system and asking, who is this actually for? Like, who is this for, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that we actually have to admit about this country is it was built for like four people. And like, that's chill but more than four people live here now. And so we probably have to think differently about what we need. Okay, Arjun, you want to? Yeah, um, <laughs> I completely agree with everything Mark said and Kay as well. Um, I think I, I love Kim's, um, well, ideological framework can we apply here? Because she knows that nobody's gonna be able to do a very good job of answering it. Um, and I think if you ask a group of 52 people, that question, you're probably going to get 52 pretty different answers. Um, like I really like to beat the um, representation drum because I think um, like we're, we're not going to arrive at an answer that works for different kinds of people unless we have those people actually making the decisions. Um, it's like my, my answer to that question is I have no idea. Um, I, I don't know what ideological framework is the right one to apply in place of the American dream, but I know that we're not going to arrive at one that is really accessible and good unless we start really thinking critically about who are the people um, making those decisions. Well, who, but who is making those decisions? Now, if we, if we think about these questions, I mean, you've right. described an actual campaign in which, and maybe this explains why Buttigieg is not on the ticket anymore, 
um, that the people making policy recommendations for his campaign weren't particularly from Europe point of view, connected to the diversity of communities, both by class, race, and other forms of difference that would have made, made those questions of representation. And we hope policy, that policy decisions that are responsive yeah. to those communities. Yeah, and yeah like just, like, just to put this like more concretely, like as you said, like Pete, had, Pete might have been on this ticket, but he, as everyone knows, had trouble getting any votes from people of color. Um, and then the campaign, we did a lot of like soul searching. We were like, we got, we got to fix this. So then instead of, like, we, we, we tried to solve this by focusing more on policy for black Americans or Latino Americans. And <laughs> the people that were writing those policies were a lot of white people. And then people would wonder, like within the campaign would wonder, why is our policy not reaching people of color? Why are they not listening? I'm like, well, look who's writing it. <laughs> like, why would they have any idea what's actually going to be something that people are going to listen to? Um, and then, you know, we hit the end of it and we still got no votes from the, these demographics. And everybody was very confused in the campaign. But then a lot of us were also like, well, <laughs> like, what did you expect given the people that were writing these policies? Yeah. Um, okay. So, thought, if that's okay, right. go ahead, Kate. Um, thinking back on your question about, uh, or your statement about how essentially in order to move up, you have to move out, right, of your community in some way. Um, and then the question of policy uh, reminded me of under the Obama administration, they tried to um, change the tax law related to what is it the 529 fund for colleges right um and in theory you would have expected the democratic party to get on board with that right but when people like nancy pelosi represent a group that are normally very liberal until it comes to their money then the conversation shifts and that kind of you know act gets thrown out the window um but I, it just makes me think about this upcoming election and the, the notion that there are a lot of people who are very active about saying I have issues with this policy and that policy and this policy, but how many of them are going to vote with their wallets at the end of the day, as opposed to their social beliefs. Well, yeah, I mean, Kate, your comment gets to another huge discussion among policymakers and social scientists about inequality in the contemporary moment here. Because what you're referring to is what um, has been called opportunity hoarding. So the Brookings Institution, Richard Reeves, both dream hoarders, um, discusses this phenomenon explicitly. And he, he argues in that piece that um, it's actually not, to use the, the, met, the metaphorical four people that that um, Mark just referred to that this country was is working for. He says, it, and it's not just the 1% who are doing well versus the 99 to use, you know, a galvanizing cry of a, a decade ago um, in response to inequality. Their argument is actually the top 20%, the people we would call upper middle class and above are the people who really are doing well. Um, even despite what's been going on in the last few years. And the reason, so the big gap is between the 80 and the 20%, right? And part of the way that they question uh, the American dream and the um, re lack, reality or lack thereof uh, uh, behind it is that increasingly, Florencia Torche, who is NYU sociology now at Stanford, also documented this extensively. It's that if you're born in the upper middle class, you have a really good chance of staying there. Actually, a greater chance of staying there than someone who's poor um, remains poor, right? In other words, there is movement but there's a hardening at the top such that this, the, the safety net supporting people who already have more than enough is hardening, so to speak. Um, and one of the ways that people do that is through these kinds of things that Kate's referencing. Um, 
making it so the values and opportunities that the upper middle class can provide for their children are the things that get measured and tracked and used as, used as criteria for things like college admission, right? So it gets us to this broader question that seems appropriate at, um, as, at an alumni event. And that's thinking about the role of higher education in this story. It used to be, and we thought of it as fundamental to these engines of mobility. Everyone's told you, you must get an education to have any chance of maintaining your class standing or moving up. But increasingly we're finding various ways that higher edu education is becoming this engine of inequality, both because of the barriers it places to entry and as many of you have referred to, the deep inequalities it produces for the students once they get in, into these schools, primarily through debt. Um, so I, where does that leave us? And I, and I suppose at some point we should open this up to questions. Um, boy, it's 1.15, man. Almost, we're almost there. Yeah, it goes fast. <laughs> Um, but yeah, let's, I would like to open it up there because if, like part of what I, I would love to hear more of your thinking on all of you collectively is if the, if we need to change the substance of the dream, in other words, maybe have a critique of the, that the most important thing in life is to get more stuff or the, the best thing in life is to be prestigious that maybe we need to articulate more specifically what a, what a new dream might look like, especially because the big thing we haven't talked about is we live in an age of climate change and all of the material stuff and the processes that produce this material wealth can't really go on forever. Um, so what do we do if we re to replace can we replace these dreams of wealth, comfort, status, and prestige with something more sustainable, equitable, and I would, I would argue much better? Anybody? <laughs> so just to help people along, like we mentioned earlier, you're welcome to use the chat. Um, or you can use the raise hand function and we will call on you or feel free to just unmute yourself and join in. I would briefly say just as a, as well, people are warming up, I, I think it's what you're saying. And, and I think to Arjun's point about like, what actually is the, the replacement here? I mean, there's deep theoretical work that needs to be done around the replacement, but I think the basics exist in formulations of economies that are oriented towards community and thriving and not towards individualism as a base, as a base, right? Um, and that our climate crisis, our inability to, to navigate uh, the pandemic, right, is all rooted in a culture that is highly individualistic in nature and doesn't actually know how to, to your point, Kim, orient people towards each other instead of up, right? Um, and that feels essential to me. Okay, this is absolutely, I, I would agree with that, but it's interesting because um, someone just wrote in the chat, but isn't this, in some ways she, she's saying, isn't this dream, even if it is individualistic in nature, kind of the thing that keeps us together collectively? It's a collective organizing principle. And if you want to ask that out loud and articulate it more fully, Jennifer, please do. Um. I don't know that I could articulate it. Hi, Mark. <laughs> um, hey, friend. I don't know that I can articulate it. Hi. Uh, more clearly, I, I just think that there is, you know, I also come from a background where there's a lot of striving and a lot of lost opportunity in terms of what the dream means and what it means for us individually and our, our individual ideas about what the dream is is uh, so determined by our gender identity, our identity, or the, you know, like all the things, all, all the things that everyone's talked about. But I think the fact of feeling that the dream is something um, 
that I am engaged with, with others in, a, I, don't, I don't even know if I can articulate it more. I think the nebulous quality of it is actually the, the thing that gives it meaning for me, perhaps. Okay, so even in our individual strivings that because we're all in some ways shaped by this particular set of ideas and, and dreams and goals, that that becomes a unifying orienting um, principle. Yeah. I think there's something to that. And yet the, the practice of it seems to be increasingly isolating, highly competitive, um, and just in my view, destructive. I see it a lot in my I mean, students and it's, I think that has changed over the years. It just gets more intense where they feel everything hinges on what they do. And if they succeed, it's because of their efforts. And if they fail, it's also because of their faults. And that's mm -hmm. especially cruel when one understands the broader range of limitations through no fault of their own that many of our students face, especially the ones who are in our prison education program where it's front and center. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but there is such a thing as Stockholm syndrome, right? Like, so you can be inside a mass trauma and be experiencing trauma together. And that is a bond, right? In therapeutic settings, we actually work to undo those bonds because trauma bonding is toxic and it destroys everybody involved. Um, so I think, I mean, like, and, and Jennifer, I'm being a little bit uh, uh, heavier handed, I think in part because I know you and Jennifer, so Jennifer and I just, for everyone else, we teach together at SVA. <laughs> so, um, but I, I think, um, yes. One of the things that uh, is is um, true, right, is that I, I think we are all inside of uh, an event that is, or a, you know, a sort of cultural event that has gone on for hundreds of years and has uh, long since reached its zenith and started to move into decline. And I think, you know, just briefly, I will say that one of the things that we don't often talk about is the damage done to those who are theoretically in power, right? Um, by these same formations. And so I just want to put on the table that like white men are ruined by what we have done, ruined by it. Don't know how to have feelings, can't talk to nobody, afraid of every goddamn thing. Like somebody's like, hey, I didn't like what you did. And white people spiral about it for days, right? Like that's not healthy. It's not a healthy way to approach conflict. It's not a healthy way to approach dealing with relationships. It's not a healthy way to approach dealing with critique. But we built a way of engaging with not just this idea of um, to to the you know form uh, formation point of like how do you get more stuff and what does that stuff mean, but like what is the process by which you do it? To Kim's point about students, right? Like what says you have value or don't, right? That the people who have the most stuff are really, really, really damaged by the process that they acquire that stuff inside of, right? And so I just think we all have to sort of take a, take a full step back and say, nobody's winning here, right? And I think that the orientation that we have towards each other, the bonds that we've created are bonds that have happened inside a, a troubling field to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, and so we might in a sort of Deleuzian sense, wow, I am back in school, think about what it would mean to reconstitute that field, right? Thousand Plateaus style, right? Give me your best body without organs. How do we do it? Mm -hmm. Well put, I think. I, 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 I mean, I, I think you're, I, I think I really want to emphasize the thing Mark just said about this system damages all of us. I, I believe, I, I do agree with that. Um, precisely because of, it almost requires alienation from each other um, to not just succeed, but maintain. Um, someone just asked in the chat as I, as I look over here, um, if, if we could speak a little bit about in what ways you see social media exacerbating these tendencies, um, distorting 
uh, the ways that individualism is shaping the discussion of, or the way people experience success and failure in the contemporary period. Anyone wanna jump on that? I will also just add, sorry, Kim, not necessarily social media related, but someone also in terms of what Mark just mentioned, someone asked if you could say more about trauma bonding, isn't facing some form of trauma part of the human experience. And now social media is part of our human experience. So maybe we can speak to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want me to just say like briefly, like what is trauma bonding? And then we can talk about social media. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and I, Suzanne, did you have your hand up too? I just was gonna say that I had a conversation with a number of my students about social media and I'll, I'll, I'll step aside so Mark can carry on, but, okay. um, and one of the things that came up was the issue of likes. Um, I use various modes of social media but I, I don't really pay attention to whether I get likes. And the students were saying how traumatic they found it if they posted something and they didn't get likes. And that was like a really big part of the entire process for them. So generationally, I couldn't really understand that, but it was clear to me that it generated a kind of trauma, though it was a form of weird pleasure, like traumatic pleasure because they're enjoying this experience, but anytime they post and they don't get likes, then then they're they're really hurt. It's really a, a big part of their relation to the medium. So I don't know if that's a helpful thought, but I do think it, it's an important part of the question you're asking. I would add before to sort of segue to Mark. Um, you know, one of the big arenas of research in this area is thinking about social media as, ex as an extension of the commodification of all forms of life in the contemporary period. And in particular, the pressure on, on young people to turn themselves into commodities, to build their reputations to um, it, through social media as one particularly obvious form of it. Um, so as to, you know, to have a presence online, be it LinkedIn for their career or really just in managing social connections, um, which su subjects themselves to a sort of ranking that appears in the form of likes or lack thereof, um, and exerts a kind of, they're responding to the pressure to curate an image. Um, that is necessarily um, distinct from who they are, right? Or, and, or they lose connection with who they are. This is the kind of alienation that seems to be, to be widely dispersed now, and, and social media is a big part of it, that maybe is part of this broader traumatic set of circumstances that Mark is getting at. Briefly, so so um, this is why this is why I remember doing a panel uh, while I was still at NYU where um, folks were like, "Why psychiatric anthropology?" And I was like, "Because you learn things about the brain and they matter." Um, and I also remember railing in mini Gallatin classes about people saying things to me, being like, "That's not science." So let's talk about trauma briefly. <laughs> so there are three main types of trauma. Um, there's uh, what we call, um, and, and let's delineate, right? So all trauma is a form of stress, right? Like it's a square rectangle situation. We talk about positive stress or eustress, right? Then we talk about traumatic stress and toxic stress. Uh, eustress is like the, and I think that when we say like everyone experiences trauma, we're actually mostly talking about eustress situations, right? Where like you had a bad breakup like a thing that like was like devastating to you in the moment, but you actually grew from, right? Like you learned how to impose better boundaries, how to tell a person like, that's not for me and I know it's not for me, so let's not take this walk together, right? So while a lot of things are often like labeled as traumatic, they are actually from a clinical perspective, use stress, right? They produce positive growth. Then there's uh, traumatic stress, right? And traumatic stress is the kind of stress that is 
uh, actually quite devastating. Um, and oftentimes when we talk about traumatic stress, we're talking about point disturbances, meaning that the thing that has happened that is bound in time, but causes tremendous disruption to a person's psychological state and structure. So in those instances, we are often talking about things like sexual assault, right? We're talking about things that are real bad, like the, the big bads, capital Bs. Those things are actually statistically unlikely, right? Like they happen, they happen to too many people and we undercount what they are. Let's be clear. I'm not saying, oh, like it's less of a problem that, it, no, 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 no. It's a really big problem, happens way more than it should, but statistically still, right? It is not what we often say, like everyone experiences trauma. That's not typically what we're saying. Then when we talk about toxic stress, we're talking about a form of stress that is uh, uh, at the level of a traumatic stress and is ongoing in nature. So that's things like uh, uh, pervasive patterns of childhood abuse, um, racism is a form of toxic stress, um, things that like don't have definitive beginning and end dates and consistently work to undermine a person's sense of self and their ability to assert their own reality and govern it. Um, and, and I wanna really be clear, right? That when we're talking about trauma and, and why I'm saying this is trauma bonding is that last sentence that what makes up trauma, what makes a trauma a, a trauma is it disrupts your ability to say, I run my life. The primary method of therapeutic, right, for any person who's experienced trauma is about returning locus of control, meaning we have to get you to believe that you are in charge of your life again, right? Why I'm saying that we are inside a mass trauma event, right, that is called capitalism is our sense of ourselves, our sense of our ability to run our own lives is actually deeply undermined by capitalist orientation, right? Our ability to say, I get to choose where I live, what I care about, who I'm in relationship with, right? All things that capitalism says, actually, no, you don't, right? And so to the point that Jennifer was making around like, well, aren't we linked by that, right? Yes, we are, but trauma bonding, right? To bring it all the way back to that definition, trauma bonding is what happens when two or more people who have experienced a traumatic event link to each other, but the linkage, right, is about talking about the trauma. It's not about, right, like, what could we build together? What, like, where are we headed? It is about reliving, right? And in some ways, reinstantiating the nature of the traumatic event. And you see it all the time in inpatient settings, right? Where, for example, uh, ED wards, eating disorder wards are phenomenally complicated to manage because what you find is that folks with eating disorders interact with each other in a way that creates a, a culture on the ward where they talk to each other incessantly about their eating and about their eating uh, uh, issues, right? And it creates, a, a, they're very tightly knit, they spend all their time together. And on the surface, you're like, this is great, everyone's bonding. But you peel that on and you're like, what they're bonding about is the trauma. So with, with that, and I know we're running out of time here, it would seem, you know, when you, Mark, you talked about capitalism being about taking away choice, but what's really deceptive and I think implicit within American dream ideology is we don't recognize the coercive nature of, of capitalism. We actually imagine it to be, we have an array of choices in front of us and our problem is how do you choose? Um, but the real deeper problem is in connecting to social media is this feeling that um, we have all this choice except for the choice not to choose. That increasingly the responsibility for all of our life choices and, and outcomes, we're responsible as individuals and there is no other social life or social system that has shaped that for us, for good or ill. And that this becomes a way that the ideological dimension keeps us from understanding the what's really happening with respect to power and what it is we can and cannot reasonably expect to be able to control. So with that, it is <laughs> It is the end yeah. of our session. <laughs> Kim, thank you for this idea and for this conversation. I am, um, it's really horrible having to end these with Gallatin because we all feel, I think we could talk for so many hours, especially there's so much to talk about in the world these days. Um, but I wanna, you know, a few things. First and foremost, I wanna take a moment to say thank you. Thank you, Arjun, Kate, and Mark for being here. Um, we really wanted, yes, 
virtual claps. Um, we really wanted, um, actually Dean Wofford and I were speaking about alumni weekend and what we wanted to do. And we thought what better than to bring alumni, our own alumni into the center of our conversations. So thank you. Um, I know a lot of what we're all talking about in every session online and offline is a lot of these subjects that can feel heavy, but I also wanna thank each of you and Kim as well personally for at least bringing a sense of awareness um, for me, that's always a positive reinforcement. So thank you for that. And um, thank you to all of you for coming today. Uh, I encourage you to also join a Stephen Duncombe session at 2.30, um, where Steve is sort of taking this question and spinning it on its head and saying, well, where do we go from here? So um, everyone's welcome to join. Thank you again, Kate. Arjun, Mark, and um, Kim. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you at the next. I do want to also thank um, uh, Kate, Mark, Arjun. Thank you so much for it's so good to see all of you. <laughs> Why I love my job. Oh. <laughs> all the Gallatin events. Everyone loves it. It is fun. Thank you, Man, you guys, we need to do this again. I we really to do this for fun. <laughs> thank you. Oh, in person would be so great. One day we will. Oh, okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. You guys were great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>